Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neosystems Big Picture Cyber Town Hall. Now I'd like to introduce your host, Ed Bassett from Neosystems. Ed? Hi there. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you, Don. Um, welcome to our continuing series of Cybersecurity Town Hall Ask Me Anything sessions. Um, my guests today, Regan Edens and Mark Montgomery. I do want to mention at the start that we are recording these sessions as part of our community outreach to the defense industrial base. Our focus at Neosystems as a managed service provider is on federal government contractors, and that's primarily who we have in our audience today. Uh, please do send in some questions from the audience if you have some. I'll work those into my conversation with Mark and Reagan. Um, I'll start with some introductions of, of these two gentlemen. Uh, Mark Montgomery serves as the Senior Director of the Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, or FDD, where he leads their efforts to advance U.S. prosperity and security through technology innovation while countering cyber threats that seek to diminish them. Uh, Mark served as the executive director of the congressionally mandated Cyberspace Solarium Commission, where he remains a senior advisor. Previously, he served as policy director for the Senate Armed Services Committee under the leadership of Senator John McCain, coordinating policy efforts on national cyber security strategy, capabilities and requirements, and cyber policy. Uh, Mark served for 32 years in the U.S. Navy as a nuclear-trained surface warfare officer, retiring as a rear admiral in 2017. Uh, Reagan uh, has a distinguished career as an Army officer and a DOD civilian in the intelligence community. Now he's focused on transformation and innovation at the cybersecurity um, firm uh, DTC Global, where he's the co-founder and chief transformation officer. Um, Reagan uh, volunteered as an original member of the board of directors of the CMMC accreditation body, now the Cyber AB, where he chaired their standards committee and co-chaired the training committee, um, helping with a lot of the foundational work on the certification side of the CMMC initiative. So Mark, Reagan, thanks to both of you for, for joining us today. Um, really happy to have you both back on this, uh, this series. Pleasure. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate it so much. Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks. So today we're going to talk about the people aspect of cybersecurity and specifically the cyber workforce. So we get out of the uh, policy nuts and bolts and the CMMC nuts and bolts for a little bit and um, and look at the, the people that power this thing. Um, it's pretty widely recognized that, you know, our cyber workforce is smaller than the number of open jobs and smaller than we need to be effective in countering some of the threats that we're facing. So um, just hoping to have a, a discussion about how we might uh, address those address those challenges. I'll start with you, Mark. What what do you see as some of the key challenges facing the the federal cyber workforce, and how does that compare to you know national workforce issues that we're dealing with? So first, I'll tell you that the federal cyber workforce, the challenges there really mirror the challenges in the national workforce. Particularly true for the .dot gov. I think the .dot mil is in a slightly better position, but in general. Um, the federal cybersecurity workforce is manned at about 65 to 70% of need. Um, that doesn't mean it's 65 to 70% of USA jobs postings. And what I mean by that is a lot of needed jobs aren't even posted. You know, they just, they don't, they don't post the requirement for five. Uh, when they need five people, they, you know, put the posting up for one or two using the federal agency. So my point on this is that it, it is about two thirds. And I, I got to tell you, you know, having run a lot of military organizations, when you're two thirds manned, uh, a, a few things happen. First, um, you probably don't get the work done, right? Or you'd have only needed two people to do it. Second, the two people who are there are, are working hard, right? And so uh, there's a, a morale issue starts to creep in. And third, and this is really uniquely painful for cyber, cyber, uh, as opposed to many other federal workforce standards, requires a refresh, either in training or certification, every 24 to 36 months. And a training program, or sometimes longer. And so you, what you really end up with is, a, is an underperforming, unhappy, uh, poorly trained workforce. That is no way to go through life, right? So we really need to, we need to tackle this. Uh, so the first problem we have is data. The fact that I kind of have to wiggle around how many billets are open is because we have bad data. Um, most of the reason we have bad data is agencies don't know what they don't know about their cybersecurity shortfalls. Um, and not, and some of it's a little willful where they really don't want to expose it all and, and have a bunch of cybersecurity personnel requirements jamming up their, their uh, HR system. But we just don't have good data. And this goes back 20 plus years. Um, 
a lot of, you know, to kind of forget where we're at is really much more anecdotal than statistical. And that's not good. And then, by the way, this is true in the pri national private sector as well. Um, like when we have a cyber heat map that says there's 744,323 openings. Let me just tell you the number of openings there are not at that moment, 744,323. There's some number. And, and what I'll tell you is the 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 broad arc of success or failure is correct in those in those in in those uh, documents those cyber seek documents like they say we're about two-thirds manned i agree with that but that exact number is is a little harder to pin down the second big problem in the federal government's diversity and this mirrors the uh um uh mirrors uh the national cyber workforce and this is the biggest diversity issue is gender uh 21 percent of the federal cyber workforce identifies as female. Uh, it's 24% in the national. These numbers are way below the actual participation of women in the federal cyber workforce. When you get to leadership, the number do drops to 11 to 14%, depending on how you define it. These are completely unsatisfactory numbers. They go back to how, all the way back to K through 12, how STEM, STEM uh, situational awareness is provided initially to boys and girls in school and middle school and high school. We, this is a large problem to fix, but were we to fix it, we would really get at our challenge more than any other diversity grouping. Fixing the gender grouping is the most critical. There are other issues to fix, but that's the critical one. I'll give you just a couple more. One is a final, you know, another challenge is coordination and leadership. The federal government just is, wasn't organized until very recently for kind of strategic level leadership. The creation of national cyber director could break this paradigm, we'll see. But, and he, she or he, in this case, he, Chris Inglis, assigned the NCD, uh, actually has the work cyber workforce role. If he could take good leadership, he and his team could take good leadership in this, that would be uh, a paradigm shift because we've had 23 years of no one really in charge. I mean, OPM manages things. NIST NICE provides a good list of what jobs should look like. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but each of the federal agencies is as strong or weak as, as, as their, uh, their team. So we didn't have coordinated leadership. And I'll give you one more before we move on. And that's the HR teams at federal agencies are not optimized for cybersecurity. So if you go to the Department of Agriculture, I'm going to put, you know, bet a little bit of my kids 529 that they are kick ass good at hiring food inspectors, right? The Department of Agriculture. Four I'm not sure. going to bet too much. I hope they are at least. I'm not going to bet too much on my 529 that they're good at hybrid, hiring their cybersecurity staff. You know, there's a unique skill set involved in recruiting, uh, developing, and, and career managing cybersecurity professionals. And, you know, it ought to be good at CISA. It ought to be good at Cybercom. It ought to be good in a lot of places. I think it's really only good where cyber is in your first name, you know, your government title. And so I, I honestly believe that, uh, you know, we have to figure out how to get the HR management work, you know, team of the federal government fixated on, on cyber professionals. And I'd say the same thing applies in our national cyber workforce. At cyber companies, I imagine their cyber skill set, management skill set's good. At infrastructure companies, it depends on the size. If they're really big, then they probably got a good cyber team. But if they're small or medium size, you know, you just have your regular HR team trying to do cyber. So that's a pretty good litany of challenges facing us uh, in the federal cybersecurity workforce, and I think mirrored in the national one. Well, thanks, Mark. We the, speaking of the gender diversity issue, we did a deep dive on this uh, this uh, this uh, program last week with Allison Giddens uh, coming to us from industry. So anybody mm -hmm. who didn't see that. Uh, encourage you to go to our website, grab the on-demand version. It was a very interesting conversation. And she talked a lot about not just getting women into the workforce, the STEM issues you mentioned, you know, the educational system, but once they're there, how do you keep them and support them and, and make sure that they, they grow into positions of high-skilled jobs and leadership positions and that sort of thing? Um, so You're right. I, I'll add into that, that Karen Evans and her team at the Cyber Resilience Institute have also looked at this, along with the confluence of the small and medium-sized businesses. I mean, they're really doing good work on these, she personally and her team on these issues. Very cool. Uh, Reagan, let me flip it over to you and, and, and ask about how, how can we get a better influx of entry-level workers to join our, our core of cyber warriors? It sounds like, you know, from what Mark said, we've got a lot of need the the feed is just not there from the from the educational system that brings people to the entry level doors. What what are your thoughts there? Well, you know, it's always uh, the first and, and last answer. Just just about every question we're going to ask is is leadership. 
So leadership is absolutely critical to, and leadership requires us to understand the landscape. And the landscape is that the technology will not save us. Uh, we have to save ourselves and it all always boils down to people. And so when we talk about um, in, inspiring the next generation of warriors, that warriorship comes from what, Ed? You and I both know this, and, and certainly Mark does as well, is mission and purpose. We want to know that what we do matters and that it's meaningful and, and, and powerfully impactful, both in, in our communities, in our, in our workplace, and at the um, national level. And cybersecurity, as we, as we know, that we do this every day, is um, a part of the frontline trenches, whether your nation st uh, state threats or organized crime or just malicious actors having fun. And so I think that when we look at the landscape and understand the landscape from the leadership perspective, that's the only way that we're really going to modify the way that we approach how we inspire people into, um, into the mission. And so when we look at what GAO says, OPM says, uh, DOD, NIST, uh, with the NICE framework that Mark mentioned briefly. Um, when we talk about uh, FISMA 22, we talk about uh, um, the uh, Strengthening Cybersecurity Act of 2022, which both sit in the House and the Senate right now. The, the landscape that we're sitting in right now is, is that the, the fight is in us and on us and where nothing is going to change. That is only going to get harder and more difficult. And so what we have to do is leaders at the at the um, um, individual level, at small team level, all, all through the um, supervisory level, up through the um, uh, business and small business leadership and to the prime contractors and, and uh, defense industrial base. We have to see the landscape for what it is, that unless we inspire folks um, to to in, in, in really give them the passion to drive into this this area of expertise, we are going to be in deep trouble. And so when we talk about skills development, it always boils down to the fundamentals, right? We talk about apprenticeship programs. The, the America was built, the Industrial Revolution was built on trade programs. And we need to rethink and retool trade programs. And we're in the process of doing that, but really inspire those, um, those young people into from, from traditional trades or, or even you know, non-traditional things into the workforce, into cybersecurity, into technology and data security, and into those trade and apprenticeship programs. That energizes people that what they're doing, the path that they've chosen for themselves makes a difference. We inspire people to join the military because of mission and purpose. And, and, and we can do the exact same thing when we transition a leadership viewpoint that the IT folks are no longer in the shadows. They're no longer in the back room. They're no longer sort of in the periphery. That they are that we've seen this in the transition of CISO role and CIO role, but what we haven't seen that really is a transition into the into the the basic workforce and 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 the and the really the salt of the earth people who make this happen. So I think that I think that the you know transition in leadership thinking is critical to energize some of the retooling that we have in place. We talk about veterans, non traditional workforce, um, uh, uh, repurposing folks and and retooling their careers. Um, those are absolutely critical for us to um, energize the workforce at the at the very entry level. Whether the entry level I start in the you know in a STEM program, you know K through uh, K through twelve, or our technical skills program, instead of learning about fixing engines, now I'm really focused on data security and and um, and uh, data warehousing and data management. So we've got a we we we've started it. But what we need to do is I think we need to inspire people, quite frankly. I mean, it, it sounds silly that something, you know, so ethereal can matter so much. But uh, all of us on this call know that inspiration and leadership is everything to the performance of the workforce. Well, Reagan, I, I really like your, your focus on the trade and apprenticeship aspect. And I think one of the things that, that I see is is people read about the rock star hackers finding zero days and catching bad actors, and they think, that's what the cyber career field is, and they think, "Oh, I'm I'm not that. I'm not a I'm not an NBA player, right? I'm I'm never going to be in the NBA or 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 Major League Baseball. So so why should I even look at that as a career field? There's a there's a need for a lot of block and tackle work, uh, tra trade you know tradesman type work in the cyber force. Um, it's not all about uh, it's not all about those glamour jobs, frankly. <laughs> and um, and so I think we need to inspire and attract people to that where they can they can make a difference without uh, feeling like they're in the top 0.0001% of the, of the, you know, the rock stars of the, of the industry. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got to, you know, just to add on that, Ed, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, to add on that, Ed, the, 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 the things that have really defined my career have been about doing things that most people don't want to do. And it's, and it's really, sometimes you have to reach far out of the area of expertise and find thinkers and doers. And you grab those folks and you say, look, we're going to solve hard, hard problems, join the fight. And they, people want to solve hard problems. They want to make a difference. And, and I think that when we combine that, that level of inspiration and in, in executing, because um, security is about the mundane. It is about the details. It is about the, really always the fundamentals. And uh, when we inspire people in, in really excellence in the fundamentals, um, you know, organizations change and they transform. Um, Mark, let me, let me flip it back to you. you, you talent retention is, is a big challenge. You, you hit on it a little bit earlier. Um, that you know, people are maybe seeing burnout if you're running at a at understaffed. That you might have burnout, and that might actually make things worse. You know, not better. Um, how do we, how do we provide a, sort of a clear and an attractive career path for people to progress from entry level into mid grade and leadership positions? How do we make sure they they don't get burned out or they don't get attracted out of these government jobs by something you know that pays better in industry or wherever they may wherever they may go. No, I, that's a good question, and and uh, certainly this is a a challenge for both the um, federal workforce and the national workforce. The the commerce Department of Commerce CIO the other day said something out loud that probably shouldn't have, which is that you know when he needs mid career level people, they're more likely to poach uh, from other federal agencies uh, than than grow. Um, that's the problem. So the number one issue we have to do is figure out how you transition. Uh, entry level people when they have their three to four years of uh, of good experience into into mid level uh, management. Um, you know, first it allows them to get to higher pay grades, but second it allows you to fill what is really the biggest hole, both in the national cyber workforce and the federal cyber workforce, which is that mid uh, mid grade expertise. Um, poaching just transfers the problem. Growing solves the problem. So how do you grow? The federal government needs to uh, build, it's not hard, a cyber development institute that says, look, for the federal government, these are the kind of certifications. When we look at the nice jobs that apply in this area, the NICE coding, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education at NIST, they've, they've, uh, they've got 52 different types of jobs. You know, some are weird like business and contracting and, and lawyers and things like that, but the, the majority are in that IT management uh, kind of uh, area, but how do you move from the, the without using the without actually being a GS eight or nine, but from the GS eight or nine job to the GS twelve thirteen job, you need to get these one or two certifications. Uh, you you know you can use private sector firms for that, and then provide a little government color on the on the front end, you know, on the back end about specific things that apply to government, particularly by classification or other issues, and provide that mid grade, and it can be done you know on the off hours or it can be done by someone being dedicated, given a dedicated two to four weeks. That really will depend. For a small federal agency that only has two or three people, you know, the very small or micro-sized federal agencies, they can't afford to lose somebody for three weeks or they can't reset passwords, you know, but, you know, the but for the larger FISMA related ones, they can let people go. My point on this is you have to have that mid-career development. And to do that, you need a cyber developmental institute. Look, I think the same thing applies in, in the, um, in the private sector. And, you know, they, you need to be able to grow your own, depending on your size, small businesses, maybe not, but medium and large businesses do. I think a lot of large businesses do this. I think most medium sized businesses don't have the bandwidth to do it. So having an easy system for doing it, whether it's with community colleges or with certification programs, that's the way to, to get it done. Look, there's a big value in keeping your own person right? They've got, they know the nuances and the tricks of the trade associated with your networks and, and servers. And, and so growing your own is definitely preferential. And, uh, and so, and, you know, that those will make the best leaders of your teams 10, 12 years on. So, you know, my recommendation is that's, is that's, is to do that. And we're going to do some congressional legislation, I hope next year to, to get at that because in the end you need to authorize this so that you can appropriate it because it's going to sit at one federal agency probably OPM to support 101 federal agencies and my general experience is no one does that gratis so you really need to authorize and then appropriate it 
Mm-hmm. Reagan, let me let me flip what Mark just said, or maybe around a little bit. He was talking about you know kind of growing your own, right? Getting people into the cyber field and then growing them into those leadership positions. What about the opposite? What about using retraining as a way to shift people from adjacent or maybe even unrelated career fields into cyber? People that already have work experience, already have maybe some leadership experience, but um, adding the cyber in, you know, mid career, so that they can uh, take their talents and apply them to these challenges. So what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I mean, fundamentally, what we're talking about are career paths and career pivots, right? Um, you know, I, I always like to tell the story that um, my mother graduated from college the same year that my older sister graduated from high school, right? And and there, there are points in our lives where we make decisions in those paths and the roads uh, uh, due to circumstances or, or um, other compelling interests that we decide, hey, look, this is a place that we want to go, or this is something that we want to do or we want to transition from X to Y. And I think that, I think that what I've seen is that when, when we, when we're talking about the scoping of retraining, whether it's veterans or whether it's, um, you know, non-traditional fields um, into uh, IT and then further, uh, further developing a skill set within uh, cybersecurity, really what we're doing is we're operationalizing um, cybersecurity into the real world. And what we're taking is those real world skill sets, those knowledge, skills, and abilities, that people build in other capacities, in other organizations. And then we apply them in the way that this company or this organization executes their, their uh, products and services. And I think that, you know, there's, a, there's in, in my um, company, we, we face this uh, challenge every single day that there's so many people that are experts uh, at CMMC. And so how do you look at the, the greater pool, cybersecurity? How do you look at the greater pool, IT? How do you look at the greater pool of operations and technology? And what you really see is that you t- can take great people from other fields and other focus areas and really apply them and train them and invest in them um, in um, IT in, in general and then in cybersecurity in specific. And that investment and part of the engagement really that Mark was talking about earlier is really about shaping the behavior, shaping, shaping the behavior of the organization to understand the, the importance of the role and the and, and the contribution, shaping the behavior of people when they do uh, when they do consider that uh, workforce pivot, that this is an opportunity that they can build on their real world skills and apply that to technology and really help in a very practical way. It's always about the execution of the fundamentals. We always talk about cybersecurity hygiene. Cybersecurity hygiene is not about um, being able to code. High cybersecurity hygiene is about executing in the fundamentals. And so when we take excellence and we take rock solid people with real skill sets, we can transition them through workforce development programs, uh, Catalyst program, and, and, and um, Ohio has a fantastic program. Uh, that focuses on veterans in retraining and, and refocusing them um, on um, um, cybersecurity and other business-related fronts. So there are programs that exist there, but again, we've got to we've got to take that marriage of real-world skill sets and 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 really demand and need, and then marry those two together. And I think that the um, what comes out of that are people who are motivated to learn, people who are driving and applying their real world skill sets to very hard problems and then leveraging technology to help solve those problems, which is ultimately the, um, uh, one of the major parts of the solution. I think there's a tendency amongst many to think of cyber, this, the career field in general as a little bit of magic, right? A little bit of art. And right. uh, I think it's, it, it's a lot like networking used to be, you know, a couple of decades ago where people who did networking, nobody really understood what they did. It just magically worked when they were done. And, um, and I think cyber is a little bit that way. And I think that it, there, we could get some mileage out of sort of mainstreaming the, the cyber skill set, right? The, the thinking, the things that, that even the technology we need to use has become pretty consumable, right? You don't need to be, um, you know, some kind of R and D. Absolutely. Or, you know, PhD in physics or something to be, to be good at cyber. And um, so I think getting that getting that skill set well understood at a mainstream level would would get uh, make it more accessible. I think um, maybe circling back a little bit, Mark, I just want to ask about uh, you know barriers to entry. I mean, are there are there things that are keeping people that have aptitude and talent uh, away from this career field? Either because they you know, I mentioned a couple of things, maybe people think it's harder than it is, or they think they need skills they don't have. But are there th- other things that that you see that are that are barriers to entry that are causing people to take a different career path other, other than this one? 
Well, with the government, there's the issue routinely we, for a certain level jobs, say GS 10, 11 will require a bachelor, you know, we'll expect a bachelor's degree, 12, 13, although that's not listed in the NICE requirements, the NICE requirements, you know, an HR team will add that on or, you know, for a 14 or 15 job, maybe a master's degree. Those may or not be the appropriate technical skills. So that, that uh, you know, it is a, a mismatch between, you know, uh, a, a, a truly technological, you know, a, a, a technical vocational uh, aim like cybersecurity and say policy management, you know, where those degrees probably do have some relevance. So that the number one thing I think we have to be on the lookout for is that number two is you need real pay flexibilities for certain skill sets Things can look very close, but if someone, you know, in addition to these other things, has, uh, you know, an on, you know, an online threat hunting skills, you know, that he de- that she or he developed working at a federal, aid, you know, at a intelligence community or DoD, you know, you have to be able to, re- you know, to sufficiently um, remunerate that per- person for that because inside the private sector they will be immediately. So we have to have those kind of flexibilities, and then finally. I think one of the things we have to do, particularly for the you know today's generation of workers, is is flexibility in where you work. And, and I don't just mean like at home in the work office. I mean being able to move between jobs fluidly. The federal government, you know, the the military's the opposite of this. Like in the in the military, I was in the military 34 years, and I moved. You know, I think I had 16 jobs, maybe 17 jobs. You know, it was a lot. Um, you know, in the private sector, yeah, I mean, in the federal government, in the IT world, it's it's frequent that if you worked 34 years, you had you were maybe at two or three agencies, and you could have been at one. Right. Uh, so we need to adjust that over time. And I actually think it'd be good to be able to move between dot mill and dot and and uh, and dot gov a little bit uh, with a little more ease. So having the flexibility for that built in, and then finally the flexibility to move into the private sector and out again, without you know. You know, there's going to be issues surrounding, you know, some of your payments, you know, how, how you know, how you get things that that were uh, delayed payment issues uh, that some of our more senior officials have when they move back and forth between companies and the government. But we need to have better ease of, you know, better flexibility and movement between the private sector and the public sector. So you can go back and forth. That kind of cross pollination would be invaluable, I think, to the federal government and probably to the private sector as well. Very good. This, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. I just want to ask one wrap-up question of, of both of you. Uh, we'll start with you, Reagan, and then and then Mark to close. So in, in closing, yeah, what's the uh, number one piece of advice to business leaders in our audience um, that need to lead their own cyber workforce and also support the you know our overall effort to do better against our threats, right? If they're, if they're looking to get, I'll call it bang for the buck, uh, what's your number one piece of advice? Reagan, I'll start with you. Sure. I think that um, I think that in uh, we need understanding the landscape and understanding leadership. Uh, leaders need to understand a simple principle, which is you can't take uh, uh, the IT folks for granted. You can't take the 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 uh, critical importance of securing your data and shaping the behavior of your organization to support and reinforce that data security, because without that. Um, it's all lost. Well, without that, we're we're literally plugging holes in the in the dam. Mark. Well, first, I, I agree with Reagan. Uh, if I could give one advice to defense industrial based companies, study how the U how the government is applying standards to the dot mill workforce, then to the dot gov, because you can bet your bottom dollar they're coming to you and your subcontractors soon. Yes, sir. Um, so I would I would be ready for that. And then if you work in the FARS world, in the .gov world, those will come to you just even later, right? I mean, uh, but the DFARS world, and I've already seen some NDA language from two years ago, a little bit from last year, getting at this. So expect more of it. And there'll be some rulemaking. In other words, through things like CMMC and others that get at it, but there'll be both legislation and rulemaking that drive whatever standard the government has into the defense industrial base and then into its... Uh, contractors and subcontractors. Thank you both. Very, very good uh, discussion today. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap things up by just announcing a couple of upcoming events that we that we have. Um, Neo Systems is hosting a CMMC day in Huntsville, Alabama on Tuesday, September 20th. Uh, Reagan's going to be there. Um, and the details are on our website under the events tab. So please uh, check that out if you have not already registered. 
And uh, we also are proud sponsors of the Cyber Guilds Uniting Women in Cyber event that's happening on Tuesday, September 27th in, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Um, as always, uh, please go to the events section of our website for the details there. It'll link you over to the Cyber Guilds uh, registration page for that event. And uh, do stay tuned for these uh, cybersecurity town hall meetings. Uh, we're doing them about every other week. It's not been, been exact, so we've been basing it on a schedule of, of the guests we want to have on. So keep an eye on our website, neosystemscorp.com. If you're not getting those in your inbox, uh, the details will always be on our on our website there. Thanks very much, everybody, and uh, have a good have a good day.